Okay. My name's Kaz. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Uh, I started a company called Waterloo Tea about six years ago. And like many of you here, um, it kind of like started uh, uh, as a result of some thoughts I had when we went for a walk in the park. Um, I thought it would be a six-month side project that I would do. Uh, six years later, it's, uh, it's become my life, I guess. Um, so much so that my wife calls the company my mistress, as uh, some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about what the company does, um, how we try to re-engineer people's thoughts on tea, um, considering that it's a drink that most people drink most days. Uh, so we just try to, um, to get people think to get people to think about it in, in a different way. To put things into context, I guess I'll just uh, go over a bit about who I am and, uh, and my history. You know that question when people ask you, and I've been speaking to a fair amount of people today about this same question, uh, what do you do? And it's, it's a horrible question, you know, you meet somebody for the first time and they say, what do you do? And I can never really answer that question, um, because it... I realized quite early on that it wasn't what I did that was important. It was really the environment that I was in. And if I was continuing my journey, so if what I was doing at that time, if that facilitated all the other things I wanted to achieve, then it was great. I realized what I did um, didn't matter when I was 17 years old and uh, I walked into the careers office in... Uh, in Cardiff High School, where I was studying my A-levels, and we had to fill out those UCAS application forms. And uh, you probably all remember walking in, uh, the, all the prospectuses were there, and you'd flick through them, and you'd see those lovely grand buildings, and even the prospectuses smelled fresh, right? They would smell of a, of a new life. And uh, Mr. Evans, my careers teacher, he, he said, so do you know what you're going to do? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'm studying chemistry, geography, and maths. Uh, I'm fascinated with volcanoes and uh, tectonic plates, uh, so I'd, I'd love to be a geologist when I grow up. Uh, and the look that he gave me, I've never really been able to describe it well. Uh, <laughs> I guess you probably had to be there, but it wasn't dismissive. It was more of disappointment, I guess. He quickly grabbed the folder and he opened it up and he showed me a table. On the left-hand side were degree courses, subjects which you could study at university. And in the right-hand column were uh, percentages, so the number of people who studied those courses who went on to get, gain employment afterwards. And he said, look, geology is right at the bottom. I suggest you choose something closer to the top. Instead of being heartbroken and my dreams being shattered, I looked at him and I thought, yeah, fair enough. You know, that makes sense. Um, I spent a year in industry. I worked for Zeneca straight after that, um, working in the lab. I studied pharmacy, uh, qualified as a chemist, and, um, and worked doing that for a few years. Um, worked for three months, traveled for three months, worked for six months, traveled for six months. Gained a love of the East. Um, gained a love of politics, strangely. Uh, so when I came back um, to the UK, I thought, you know what? Uh, screw you, Mr. Evans. I'm going to study what I like now. And um, I studied a master's in international relations. And the dissertation was on, um, I tried to marry up everything I'd done in the past. So it was on the inability of uh, pharmaceutical companies to um, invest in diseases that affected poor people, uh, tropical diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria. Uh, moving on, I moved back to Cardiff. Uh, we got married, settled down in Cardiff. And um, this walk in the park I started off by mentioning. We were walking in our local park. It's called Waterloo Gardens. And uh, we had our first child, and we thought, you know, it's a shame there's nowhere around here that we can sit down and have a nice cup of tea and, you know, put our feet up. Um, there was a row of four shops there, a butcher's, a hairdresser's, a, um, a post office, uh, and, and a grocery store. Two days later, funnily enough, the butchers closed down. And, um, you know, I thought nothing of it. I was a bit of a dreamer, less, you know, I wasn't so much of a doer. Uh, the next week, my wife 
came in and handed me a bit of paper, and she said, uh, and he had a telephone number on there, and she said, that's the name of the landlord. Um, I think you should just go ahead and do it. So we opened up um, Waterloo. Uh, how do I do this? Oh, yeah, this one, right? <laughs> uh, we opened up uh, a tea house. Um, uh, within eight months, we had won the only industry award, uh, so three unannounced visits from industry experts uh, for best cafe in the UK. So, uh, so it showed that there was a demand for, for what we were trying to achieve, which was all based around the palate and exploring, your, uh, exploring taste. Uh, last year, we opened our second tea house. Uh, in two weeks' time, we'll be opening our third in, in the centre of Cardiff. Uh, the, the spaces are social spaces. This is our third shop here, and there'll be an art gallery in there which will, will dominate the space. Um, and there'll just happen to be nice tea and coffee served. About two years in, uh, we were getting requests from friends of ours in the industry uh, who had coffee shops or who, who, ha who had coffee roasters. They wanted to get hold of tea, and they saw that we were doing a good job. So every time we would fly in tea after that or ship in tea, we would get a bit extra for them. Uh, it was then I started thinking about the wholesale tea industry and how it was not fit for purpose. Uh, I remember having a meeting uh, with one of the biggest brokers in, in the UK, sitting down with him and saying, hey, you know, uh, this is what we're about. We want to get like this season's tea and for it to be the best pick of the season and for it to have known provenance. And the conversation continued uh, until he said, um, we've got a great Darjeeling first flush. It's, uh, it's, it's five years old. It's a vintage. Um, and I realized that he had a warehouse full of tea that he just wanted to sell. Uh, and it was a shame, you know? It was a lot of um, smoke and mirrors. Uh, so we put a bit more effort into our wholesale side after that. I'm a terrible salesman, you know? And uh, often when somebody says to me, I want to buy this, 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 and this, I'll just say, just buy this and see how it goes. Um, and I think it stems from the experience that I had working in a pharmacy where it was pretty unethical to have people, you know, walking out of the pharmacy with a carrier bag full of drugs. <laughs> um, things also needed to be fit for purpose, I guess, you know. And uh, so when we had partners, wholesale, potential wholesale partners who wanted to um, explore these kinds of teas, we would really try and give them what suited, what we felt suited them. Um, and what they asked for, I guess, you know, it had to be a really good fit. Um, so we, we, that's been growing. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy, you know, we, we don't have a sales team, we don't have people on the road, we don't do any marketing. Everybody who we work with has approached us or tasted our tea in other places. Um, our tea can be found in, you know, Cardiff, Dublin, Edinburgh, uh, Berlin, Amsterdam. Adelaide, uh, Dubai, um, but it's a real relationship. What they learn from me, I learn more from them. Uh, we, we email each other about random stuff. <laughs> so what I do, what I do isn't important because it allows me to be here today. Um, these are the kind of things that we do. So this is at TED Global in Edinburgh. We worked with them for a few years uh, when they were here. Um, and these were the kind of presentations of tea we had in between lectures there. Some people would think they were scared to come up and drink them because they thought they were art displays. The, the crux of what we try and achieve as a company uh, is trying to re-engineer your thoughts of what tea should be. And, um, and it's a tricky one, you know, it sometimes can be trying to tell somebody how to suck eggs, because it's something you've been doing all your lives, you know? Uh, and for me to come up and say, actually, what you've been doing for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's wrong. Uh, so it's been an exciting challenge to, to get the message over. The key thing was this, to change this around, you know? Uh, we drink tea at home, and we drink coffee when we go out. And that was because uh, with big coffee chains, uh, starting off 25, 30 years ago, 
Yeah, you'd walk into a coffee shop, there'd be a lot of razzmatazz. There would be the espresso machine, there'd be the grinder, there'd be the barista behind the coffee machine doing his magic skills. And you know, if you were lucky, you'd get a pattern on top of the coffee. Um, so there was added value. You couldn't do that kind of stuff at home, right? With tea, it was invariably, you'd go out and you would uh, get served a mug of boiling hot water with a tea bag plonked in there. So people didn't really want to go out and didn't feel as it was justified that they should go out and pay money for that. So we had to change that. And we went about it uh, in a structured fashion, I guess. The first thing was to educate. The second thing was uh, to educate people on the actual product. The second thing was to teach them how to serve it well. The third thing was how to engage with their customers and um, let them know that what they, was doing, what they were doing was different. Tea. Black tea, green tea, white tea, and an oolong. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Everybody knows what tea is. If you could define tea in a sentence, would you be... Does anybody want to shout out what tea is, what I'm talking about? Bush. Bush? Any it? <laughs> <laughs> I never know what to say when it's not the right answer, you know? <laughs> but it's, yeah, you could say bush, but if you were to define it, so that's probably a description, but how would we define tea? Like jam and bread. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Any more? Top two shoots. Say that again? Top two shoots of camellia. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So camellia, camellia sinensis. T is camellia sinensis. So that's the mother of the, of the family, I guess. You can have different varietals and different cultivars grown for different terroir. Um, but that's what tea uh, is made from. If it doesn't have camellia sinensis, we call it an infusion or a tisane. So things like chamomile, rosebuds, uh, rooibos. Um, peppermints, they don't have camellia sinensis, sinensis in there. They don't have caffeine. So the reason why tea and coffee are popular, right? And I'm not just saying this because I'm a pharmacist. It's because they're socially acceptable drugs. They don't freak you out too much in public. <laughs> <laughs> the um, black tea, green tea, white tea, and an oolong. Black tea is oxidized. The green tea oxidization is, is prevented. So they denature the enzyme, that, which allows oxidization. The white tea it's the least, least processed of all, all the teas. It's literally dried and whacked in a bag. Uh, the oolong is repeatedly heated and rolled to trap those aromatic oils, which deliver flavor when the tea leaves unfurl. These are the kind of things that we would be telling our wholesale partners about, our customers who walked into the tea house about. And it's amazing that they've been drinking this, this drink all their lives, and they never knew this. They never knew what they were drinking. This is the wall menu of one of the tea houses. And we, this came about after visiting. I think I was in Heathrow Airport, and there was a coffee shop there. And they had two columns uh, on their menu. And uh, uh, it had, uh, what did it have? It had, um, like, coffee and coffee and flavored coffee and iced coffees and hot chocolates and juices. And then it had one line right at the bottom. And it said, specialty tea, £1.25. Uh, I just wanted to flip that on its head. So when you walk into our places, you've got a whole world full of different types of tea that we sell. Sometimes in business, I guess, you know, um, you make compromise. So before we opened, I, would, I was adamant. I said that uh, we would only sell unadulterated teas. Uh, they would all be single origin and true to the historical processing methods other than things like Earl Grey or Jasmine Green, you know, which are the most popular blends in the, in the West and the East. But I had to step back a bit and, I guess, compromise in a way, but maybe look at the bigger picture and what we were trying to achieve, and that was to get people started on their tea journeys. So not to get them so far removed from what they were used to, but just maybe if they started off by drinking a mint green, then they could relate to that they would graduate to something that was unadulterated. Uh, and we would be able to provide them that tea, that unadulterated, fantastic, shade-grown Japanese green that, that we hoped that they would one day move on to. It was a comprehensive list. We, we provide a comprehensive list of teas. Uh, so I, I think that was important. When we first spoke to friends and people who we came across about opening 
a tea house and it's like any business when you speak to people about your ideas, you normally, you hope for a positive response. Um, and um, this was our first flyer before we opened because a lot of people I was speaking to were saying, I'd say, you know, we're going to have these kind of teas and we're going to be doing this. And a lot of people were saying, yeah, green tea sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> and I would think, oh my God, okay. Uh, and people were pouring boiling hot water on top of green tea and it makes, makes it taste bitter. We have, still have customers who come in who say, this green tea doesn't taste right. And I say to them, why? And they say, it doesn't taste bitter. So we had to <laughs> re-engineer people's thoughts on a drink they drink most days our first flyer, and this is what we did about it. So these are countertop fonts, uh, two paddles on each of the fonts, and under the counter, we've got four boilers, each output in different temperature waters, 65 degrees, 75 degrees, 85 and 95. Japanese teacups don't have a handle on them for a reason. They never, they are never brewed with boiling hot water. Uh, so this is, um, so these kind of things, we try to add a bit of science uh, into, uh, into how we serve the teas. These are all the things that we tell our wholesale partners. Make it engaging. You know, um, you can see the color of the infusions. The first picture when, we, when I showed you the blacks and the greens and the whites and the oolongs. If you have those out, people instantly started asking questions. You know, they were taken outside of that bag that people are so used to with the tag on the end. Things like teaware, you know, when you go to a fancy hotel where, you know, tea had been. Uh, left to the, in the domain of fancy hotels and quaint little tea rooms. And they survived on their environment, everything but what was served on the table. You serve tea in a big teapot, and the first cup tastes okay, but the second cup is over, over brewed and, and, and bitter. So you have to uh, take the tea leaves out, so you have to separate the infusion, things which are so obvious when I'm saying it now, but they're still not done. Um, so these are the kind of things that we got across. And these are the things that friends of ours who we work with in all these different places, they are now doing. And that's team movement starting around, following on the footsteps of things, that the, the, the journey that wine took, that food is taken, that coffee is taken. Tea is following that now. Just to finish up, it's been an enjoyable journey, I guess. Um, it's been a battle sometimes to tell people you don't have to have milk and sugar with your tea because uh, it's going to taste nice without it. You don't need to mask the flavors. That journey, that what do I do, I guess tea has been the vehicle for me to be able to be here, be able to engage with people, to develop my skills. Um, and just to finish up, uh, next time you have a visitor, and obviously when they come in, you'll always say, shall I put the kettle on? Just remember the few of the things I, that I went over. Um, that'd be great. Thank you very much. <laughs>